Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you another in their exciting new series of broadcasts on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Hallmark will bring you true-to-life stories of actual persons who, in their own way, have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Presented on the Hallmark Hall of Fame by our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame, where each Sunday night we dramatize a true story for you, a true story about real people to whom we respectfully dedicate this Hallmark Hall of Fame. Those men and women whose service, sacrifice, and devotion have made our own lives better, but about whom we know all too little. Tonight, we honor a man who conquered the Atlantic Ocean. No, not Christopher Columbus, not Charles Lindbergh. Compared to those two giants, few of us know the name of Cyrus Field, the man who brought two hemispheres within a split second of each other by laying of the Atlantic Cable. Listen then to the true story of one of the greatest achievements in the history of mass communication. And now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you're looking for a way to say something to someone you care for, look for a Hallmark card and you'll find the card you want to send. Because Hallmark Cards are designed to say what you want to say, just the way you want to say it, with the good taste you demand of anything that bears your signature. That's why Hallmark on the back of a greeting card has come to mean you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor picture Lily, starring Leslie Caron, Mel Ferrer, and Jean-Pierre Amont. And now, here is Lionel Barrymore with the first act of your Hallmark Hall of Fame. Man learns to walk, and then he learns to speak to make known his needs and wishes and desires, and so it is with a nation. In 1837, America was growing into lusty manhood. It was also finding a new voice, a voice of sound and electricity given to it by Samuel Morse. The new giant among nations began to shout across vast distances but the voice was stopped at the edge of the sea. Implacable, the Atlantic waited through the years for a challenge. From whom would it come, and when? Well, nobody knew, not even Mary Field, as she and her young husband, Cyrus, paused to watch the surf during an evening stroll along the beach. The year is now 1854. Cyrus, is anything wrong? Wrong, my dear? No. Why? Well, you you seem so preoccupied of late. You should be happy. You retired so you could relax and enjoy life. At the age of 35? But you've accomplished a great deal, Cyrus. I just know that my mind and my hands cry out for work. This country is growing. I want to do something new, important. <sighs> do I sound pompous? Well, I must say you sound most ambitious. I mean it very humbly, Mary. I want to be worthy. Worthy of you, worthy of my country and what it has given to me. You do understand. Yes. I guess I'd forgotten that you were really two men. I wanted to have both of you to myself. But I guess that stubborn one will always insist upon working. Dearest Mary. What will you do, Cyrus? Return to the old business? No. Now, I've been thinking about 
That engineer, Fred Gisborne. Gisborne? The gentleman who came to you with that... <laughs> that wild scheme about a telegraphic cable from New York to Newfoundland? Oh, it's not a wild scheme, Mary. A cable under the water? Why, of course it's wild. It would... <laughs> it would get all rusty and everything. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Uh, it might. There. Now be serious. What are you going to do? Mary... I'm going to lay a telegraphic cable from New York to Europe, under the Atlantic Ocean. Well, there's no sleep for Cyrus Field. Each day sees a hundred letters written or received, and the house lights burn through the night as small groups of men gather to hear his plan. Some of them leave without bothering to conceal their laughter. Others frown, few are thoughtful. A year of preparation, and then the final interview. The important interview. Samuel Moss finally received Cyrus Field into his home. How old are you, young man? 36, Mr. Moss. Well, at the rate you've been flooding my home with letters, you must have started writing them when you were 10. <laughs> I didn't intend to inconvenience you, Mr. Moss. It doesn't matter. I'm going to be blunt, Mr. Field. What you propose to attempt is impossible. But it isn't, sir. How can you say that? You have in your own writings predicted a transatlantic cable. In time, yes, but not now. It's too uncertain. No sane person would invest a penny in such an enterprise. If you had investigated the difficulties to be encountered, you'd have abandoned the project long ago. I'm not an idle dreamer, sir. I've been in preparation for more than a year. I've consulted engineers. I've studied every available chart on the topography of the ocean floor. Uh, since you've already wasted your time, please be prudent enough not to waste your money. My personal investment is already spent, sir. Spent on what? A hundred thousand miles of copper wire with more to come. Options on 10,000 tons of iron for casing and thousands of bales of insulating material. Too bad you haven't enough left to build a ship to carry your purchases. There isn't a vessel in the world big enough to attempt it. Not one. Two vessels can do it, sir. Two war frigates. One from America and one from England. They'll give me the ships with your help. War frigates are not equipped for carrying or laying cable. But they can be refitted, sir. I've been over it with Brunel, the shipbuilder. Here are the plans. And here are the blueprints for the cable laying machine. You're a very industrious young man, Mr. Field. I'm going to lay that cable, sir. May I have the honor of your support? I'm sorry. I admire your enterprise, young man. Now, don't permit yourself to be ridiculed as a fool. If I were afraid of a word, I would have little chance to conquer an ocean. The label of fool leaves a very deep scar. A scar can become a mark of honor, sir. When I was a boy, the world was snickering at a man who made a one-inch spark jump from a laden jar. <laughs> but... He went on with it, though, and gave the world a telegraph. His name was Samuel Morse, sir. Good night, sir. Oh, just a moment, Mr. Field. As long as we're going to be partners, you'd better stay for dinner. Well, Morse was conquered. Now Cyrus Field could face the final foe, the Atlantic Ocean. Mountains of copper and iron and insulation to be woven into cable. For two years it grew, coil upon coil. Field was ready to take his first small step. And it was a successful one. The cable was laid from New York to Newfoundland. And now for the real battle. 2,000 miles of open sea. The Atlantic, like a giant disturbed in its sleep, began to toss and mutter, turning its baleful green eyes to the puny trespasser. Here are the charts, Mr. Field. Oh, thank you, Captain. You better have a look at these, Mr. Morse. All right. You too, Fred. Yes, sir. Now, here's our starting point, gentlemen. Now, one end of the cable is secured to the land station. As we start laying it out to sea, we'll be able to keep in constant contact with them. By communicating through the cable as it's being unwound? That's right, Captain. We've got almost 1,200 miles of cable aboard the Niagara. When we finish laying that, we'll be 
About here in mid-ocean. You'll keep me informed on speed changes? Of course. Now, the British frigate, the Agamemnon, has an equal amount of cable on board. She'll accompany us out to mid-Atlantic, at which point we'll transfer the end of our cable to her for splicing. And she'll lay the second half. All clear? Perfectly. Now, that's it, then. Machinery all in order, Fred? Oiled and ready. May the good Lord be our guide, gentlemen. All right, Captain. You may get underway. She's getting pretty rough this morning, Fred. Better not get any rougher. The cable winches aren't turning fast enough when we hit the big swells. You haven't got them braked, have you? I should have, but I don't dare. What depth are we in? Almost two miles. Oh. Means a lot of weight and strain. I know. Oh, Captain's coming down. Better ask him if he can reduce forward speed just a little bit more, huh? All right. And may I see you for a moment, Captain? Just coming to see you. How much will that cable take you? It's close to maximum tension now. Why? The Rama has gone crazy. We're on the verge of a bad squall. Look. Look at that wave coming. You are on the cable engines. What's your control? Keep those brakes off. Let the cable run free. How's the cable? It looks all right. Well, that's our first taste of the storm. See if we're still in contact with the shore station. I'll signal them. Answer. Why don't they answer? There it is. There's another swell coming. Here comes Mr. Morse. Take hold of that ladder, Morse. Take hold. Yes, but the cable in the hold is shifting. If it kinks up, we're in real trouble. We need all hands below. There's no need now, Mr. Morse. But the cable will be broken. Look astern, sir. It is broken. The storm wasn't your fault. What do I say to you, my dear? What do I say to the people who trusted me? There's only one thing you need say to me. Just that you love me. You know I do. As for the others, I know what you're going to say to them. It's been in your mind for days. Yes. If every man stopped at his first defeat, we'd have no country. We'd have no world. This ocean can be conquered. And I swear before heaven... It will be conquered. In just a moment, we return to the second act of our true story of Cyrus Field. What does Easter mean to you? A stroll to church with your family and friends? A child's delight in his Easter basket? or the first fresh tulips in the garden. For most of us, Easter means all these things and something more. It's the time of year when we long to share our joy in the shining new season with all our loved ones, near and far. And that's why I think you'll appreciate the varied collection of Hallmark Easter cards you'll find at fine stores across the country. You see, there's a Hallmark Easter card for everyone you're fond of, from grandmother to the tiny tot next door. You can select religious greetings that recall the holy promise of the first Easter Sunday, or light-hearted cards bedecked with bunnies or flowers or pert spring bonnets. And you can be sure of it, each Hallmark Easter card you mail will gladden the heart and lift the spirits of the receiver. So why not get yours soon? Just look for the Hallmark and crown on the back, the familiar symbol you always look for when you care enough to send the very best. And now, here is Lionel Barrymore. <laughs> His determination fired by his failure, Cyrus Field started again, pitting himself and his cable against the Atlantic Ocean. But the sea wouldn't yield. The second time, and a third, the ships returned with the frayed and broken cable trailing aft. All hands were ready to give up. 
all but Cyrus Field. Morse, there's one last thing I want to try. What's that? Instead of starting with the cable joined to a land station, I want to start laying it from mid-ocean. Join the cable there and head to Niagara for America while the Agamemnon heads for Britain with a cable connecting the two ships, laying it out between them. We can maintain telegraphic contact between the two vessels. It's the only way we haven't tried. When was your last telegraphic signal from the Agamemnon, Fred? On the hour, two minutes ago. Oh, five days. Five days with nothing going to miss. How much cable have we let down? Just over a thousand miles. Good. And the Agamemnon has laid the same. I can't believe it. If nothing goes wrong, if nothing happens... Oh, Land ho! Land ho! Fred. Fred. Land! Land up the starboard bow! Keep that cable rolling, man! Land! The Agamemnon, they're calling Well, what is it? What do they say? Wait, wait. <laughs> They've sighted land, too, Cy. They've sighted land, too. Cy, you've done it. You've done it. News of the completed cable rocked the world. A message from James Buchanan, the President of the United States, was immediately telegraphed to Victoria, Queen of England. The Queen replied within minutes, for the first time in history, instantaneous communications between the two hemispheres. Pandemonium heralded the dawn of a new era. A two-day holiday in New York to honor Cyrus Field. No forewarning of the trouble to come. The cable lies silent during the festivities, waiting for the formal opening of regular service. A momentous occasion. President James Buchanan will personally handle the telegraphic key. Uh, well, now, uh, are we ready, gentlemen? Yes, Mr. President. If you will step over here. You just tap the key a few times, President Buchanan, and the London end will answer. Really? Just sit right here, sir. Uh -huh. Now, uh, when I touch this key, they'll actually receive it in London and answer me. In a split second, sir. What a wonderful, fabulous age we live in. Uh, may I go ahead? Whenever you wish, sir. Proceed. Splendid. They'll answer almost immediately. Fred? Sir, uh, may I try the key a moment? Uh, of course, Gentlemen, is anything more? Oh, thank heaven. That wasn't a London return, Si. It was Newfoundland. What? They're reporting the London cable dead. It can't be. Fred, it can't be. There's some technical difficulty, perhaps, gentlemen? No, sir. The cable has been broken. I see. Well, that's most unfortunate, gentlemen. Of course... Now, my message to Queen Victoria was prepared at the time of your first venture. I presume that her message to me might also have been prepared uh, some time ago. Mr. President, I hope you don't now, think... Mr. Field, I'm just pointing out a fact that skeptics will make capital use of. Gone were the bands and the crowds. Quietly in disappointment, they turned away. A few jeered or exchanged unkind whispers. A great deed became an unpleasant memory. And five years passed. For Cyrus Field, five years of brooding. History moved on. Only the sea was unchanged. He's always down here by the water. He likes to be alone at times. Mary, uh, maybe I shouldn't have come. Oh, he'll I... be delighted to see you, Fred. There he is. Cyrus? Hmm? Oh, Mary. And Fred, sigh. Fred. 
Oh, what have you been doing? Where have you been? It's been years. Oh, I haven't been doing too much. Been in Europe the past two years. Sure. Do they say the same things there about us? That the cable was a fake, that there never was a message? Fred isn't even going to answer that. You both know the truth, and so do I. Yes. And so does the sea. The truth is buried out there someplace, lost forever. The truth is never lost forever. Well, I suppose not. Where was the flaw, Fred, the weak spot? Was it where we made the splice between the two ships? I stopped wondering a long time ago. If only there had been one ship big enough. One ship big enough to carry the entire cable and equipment. Maybe there never will be. There's one big enough right now. Twice the size of anything you've ever seen. No. I saw it. You remember Brunel, the shipbuilder? Of course, I remember. He refitted the Niagara for us. The sea hasn't been too kind to him, either. He built the ship I speak of, the Great Eastern. Oh? Huh? Well, did something happen to it? Did it sink? Sink? No, no. But it will probably rot. Nobody wants it. They say it's impractical. Well, then they're wrong. Brunel is no fool. Oh, if only we had the Great Eastern. We could have laid one cable straight across. One that our friend out there wouldn't grind apart. The Great Eastern is rotting. You could make use of it, Cyrus. You and Fred, now. Mary. You did it once, didn't you? Fred? Anything with you, Cy. You know that. But uh, it'll take money. I haven't any. I'll get it. Where? Oh, from friends, neighbors, strangers, anybody I can talk to. Anybody who believes in this country, I'll get it. And get it he did. From people who believed in America and progress and the future. From rich and from poor, from $10 to 10000 he charted the Great Eastern. And in July of 1866, the transatlantic cable was laid. No failure this time. Not one message, but hundreds and thousands. Two hemispheres within a second of each other by day and night. Good morning, my dear. Breakfast is ready. Oh, and the same mountain of mail again. Mm, well, it never stopped. Help me open some of them, will you, dear? Of course. Mm. <laughs> Here's one from Fred. His daughter isn't impressed by him at all. Just keeps asking why he can't fix her broken perambulator. <laughs> Mary, what's the matter? This, this letter I've opened. Hmm? Oh, darling, I've waited so many years for this letter. Read it. Dear Mr. Field, I'm truly delighted with the success of your new cable. You have proven to the satisfaction of the entire world that the honors accorded you all too briefly for your first cable were truly and are now doubly deserved. I hope that all who doubted you will now be as loud in their acclaim as they were in their criticism. Your friend and admirer, James Buchanan. Transatlantic cable Cyrus Field laid in 1866 is still in operation today. And from the very first, it carried the voice of our nation across the seas, making our pulse beat the pulse beat of the world as we grew and learned and thought. The distant lands were no longer distant. Men could make known to each other their most urgent needs. Fast communications led to new speed and innovations in transportation with bigger ships and greater railroads, conquering time and space, dispelling ignorance and destroying want. Did Cyrus Field retire? No. He went on with America, dreaming, building, and helping her grow down through the years. And next week, we're nominating another remarkable person for our Hallmark Hall of Fame. <coughs> and I want to tell you a little about him. But first... <coughs> Here's Frank Goss to tell you about the rebirth of a charming old custom. 
Long ago, when the pilgrims came to America, they brought with them a charming custom. It seems that on a certain day in May, all the children gave May baskets to their friends. They were simple little baskets woven from grass or rope and filled with wild flowers. When a May basket was left on a doorstep, it meant, I like you, you're my friend. Today, thanks to the makers of Hallmark Cards, May baskets are back again. Yes, your youngsters can discover the fun of giving May baskets that they make themselves. All you need do is supply them with Hallmark May baskets you'll find at fine stores across the country. Each package of Hallmark May baskets contains five different paper baskets, delicately colored and ready to put together without glue or scissors. And the cost is low, just 50 cents for the entire set of five. You'll know Hallmark May baskets by the Hallmark and crown on the package, the symbol you look for on your greeting cards when you care enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Well, I'm certainly pleased to hear that Hallmark cards are helping to bring back the real meaning of May Day because the meaning of this beautiful day has sure been corrupted and distorted these past years. So that today, if you ask most people about May Day, the first things that come to their minds are demonstrations and uprisings and, and protest marches and the like. Well, I, I much prefer to think of the 1st of May in the words of Thompson. Wide flush the fields, the softening air is balm, echo the mountains round, the forest smiles, every sense and every heart is joy. <coughs> yes, sir. To me, the first day of May is the promise of summer. It's the reawakening after a long, hard winter, and it's certainly a day for rejoicing with one's friend. Well, before I get completely lost in my spring fever, I'd better tell you about next week's play on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. It's the true and very inspiring story of Catherine Mumford Booth and the founding of the Salvation Army. Well, I know you want to miss that. Our Hallmark Hall of Fame is every Sunday. <coughs> our producer director <coughs> is William Gay, and our script tonight was written by Joel Merkert. Until Sunday then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. The part of Cyrus Field is played by John Stevenson, with Barbara Eiler as Mary Field, Whitfield Connor as Fred, Herb Butterfield as the captain, Ted DeCorsi as James Buchanan, and Norman Field as Samuel Morse. On Sunday afternoon, April 26th, there will be a special Hallmark Hall of Fame program. Hallmark Cards will present Mr. Maurice Evans in his two-hour television production of William Shakespeare's Hamlet. Consult your paper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when we present another true-to-life story of actual persons who, in their own way, have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Next Sunday, we honor Catherine Mumford Booth on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.